I'm really excited to welcome everyone to this semester's first evening lecture and also really happy to see such a full auditorium. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to welcome this evening Julia Bordova and Olga Alexakova of Bureau Moscow. As the name of their firm implies, Bureau Moscow is deeply embedded within the fabric and history of urban transformation of Moscow in the post-Soviet era. This examination and fascination with the city they know, love, and are registering and in turn shaping through their work is the subject of their advanced studio this semester, which we are very lucky to have them teach since it's an incredible opportunity for all of us to gain insight into a city few of us know or understand well. This insight is literally enabled by an incision, that of the railway route city diameter two, which cuts into a fabric made up, made up of, and I quote from their writings, enclaves we did not know and do not see, hidden behind fences or cut off by railroads and highways, existing only on Google Maps, with some of these areas uh, as huge um, as they could, they could fit entire um, cities unfolding for us as a beautiful panorama of contrasting and complex realities to become the inspiration, this cross-section of the life of the city becomes their proposed context for the architectural interventions they are, they are inviting all of you students to imagine, at least within the context of the studio. Many of us would dream of working through Bureau Moscow's various commissions, the extent to which they have succeeded in reinventing social housing, for example, advancing various building technologies such as modular and prefabricated construction, but also embracing a certain playfulness through boldness of form, color, and graphics are a wonderful inspiration for all that could be done with housing today. Their commitment to reinventing existing public space, such as with their winning competition for the renovation of Triumphalnaya Square, with added um, swings, pavilions, and raised gardens to a square in central Moscow, brings this lightness and playfulness to everyday life. And their passion for education and pedagogy was most recently made uh, architectural in their very beautiful kindergarten, which was a laureate for the Arc Soviet Prize a building and project which again displays the kind of playful yet powerful sensitivity their work brings together, always locating architecture beyond art or technology and its practice as deeply creative but also as deeply involved with politics and economics. Both Julia and Olga are committed to education, maintaining academic engagements, both in Moscow, but also as visiting critics as they are this semester with us around universities uh, around the world. Julia is currently a professor at Moscow Architecture School, Mark? March where she focuses on the issues of rethinking the Soviet social housing um, uh, um, history as well as the city's urban planning heritage and the new economic conditions. Olga was a supervisor of the Straka Institute Research Prog Program on Energy, which explored the future of fossil fuels in Russia in 2012. Both are members of the Architecture Council of Moscow, have spoken at various urban forums and conferences, as well as participated in juries around the world. Olga is also a consultant to different agencies on changing norms and regulations in urban planning uh, and housing. And so it's very inspiring to have them both here tonight, um, sort of demonstrating the possible connections uh, between architecture, planning, um, housing, and much more. Please welcome um, Bureau Moscow. Thank you, Amal, for such a warm introduction. You almost made us cry, sort of, and also gave a summary of our lecture. So um, uh, we're very th thank you for the invitation, for having this opportunity to, talk, to uh, talk about our work. Very excited to be in Colombia. You have amazing students, and the whole place is just like wonderful. Um, we called our lecture Common Practice, and of course we're going to talk exactly about exactly the opposite, since our practice is uh, everything else but common. Our buildings may look like they are, like, can be anywhere, but actually we work, uh, we found uh, ourselves when we opened our office uh, 15 years ago, we found ourselves in the environment where houses are made in factories, Urban planning is done in Excel, and urban space at that time sort of didn't exist. 
And if you look at uh, Moscow, you will see that as uh, many uh, typical Russian cities, it has a very um, uh, tight core, but the outside of this, that core is the uh, newly built uh, housing areas, which actually was built in the 60s and 70s and uh, 80s, and they are consist of micro districts. <laughs> and um, actually, this is very, uh, very typical Moscow area nowadays. And after the war, it was enormous shortage of housing. And um, uh, after Stalin's death, then uh, Khrushchev came, and in 1956, he launched the new housing program, uh, which was about to build, uh, to give everybody the apartment in a fully prefab five-story high house, houses. And uh, this idea was spread, spread all over the world in 20 all the years, all over the country for 20 years. And this is the picture of a famous kitchen debate in the American exhibition in Sokolniki, where Nixon was saying that every American could afford now a ten to fifteen thousand uh, dollar home. To which uh, Nikita Khrushchev answered that to have a home in Soviet Union, you only have to be born there. And this is the idea, which is still uh, like this massive uh, that the, the housing is something that is provided. So housing is something that uh, the state gives you and the state uh, owes to give you. And the, which uh, creates also a very uh, like abstract relationship to housing. It's all about, like, see, when people buy, still, when people buy apartments, they buy square meters. They don't buy a dream. They uh, buy something that should provide them with a place to live. <laughs> So in the 60s, house was still a dream. This is a piece of Shostakovich's opera, which is called Novy Cheremushki, and it's the same, it's the name of the first prefabricated area that was built at the time. So that was how Cheremushki looked like. Actually, Cheremushki, it's, it's a bird cherry tree. So it's a romantic name for, actually, it's a symbol, it's a symbol of uh, new uh, development, housing development from 60s. And uh, the scale of operation is astonishing. Uh, two years ago, we had in Moscow Architecture School, we had a studio which was dedicated to housing. And we had the students for, from all over the country. And we asked them to uh, draw their homes. And could you imagine that out of uh, three, it was three uh, match, exact matches out of 12 people. So this is a very good uh, so, uh, theme for sociological research, uh, how to uh, whole nation were grow about the whole nation which were growing up in the equal conditions. 
<laughs> and it's not about just typology. It's not like Dutch row houses or Berliner apartment. These are exactly same apartments. Uh, and when it comes to uh, urban uh, planning, then uh, it's done in this Excel sh sheet. And this sheet appeared before Excel even existed. It's the number of square meters per capita, number of green, it's amount of green, amount of uh, kindergartens, amount of the uh, space around the house. And this table that we are still working with when we do urban planning, because you do urban planning in like in these micro districts and big chunks of uh, urban fabric, uh, the last uh, uh, time the text was changed is in 86. That's, I think, before most of you were even born. And, but the, like, things changed, the market economy came, but the code is still uh, the same. If you look at the typical, uh, whatever, 70s areas, if you dissect it, that's it, it is kind of uh, the field of uh, worm-like buildings in the field. And here no. you, you see the typical set out of uh, that uh, the micro district could be easily done. And the first row, it's a uh, building block uh, with the co small corner details. The second row, it's a straight uh, block uh, building. Uh, the <coughs> third one, it's a kind of more complicated corners. And the next one, it's the schools and kindergarten. And then it's uh, some administration. And the last row, it's a uh, parking. Boiler houses. Yeah, boiler, boiler houses. So uh, uh, you see that every... Apartment block consists of two, only two different sections, which face north and south, and the second one fa uh, face east-west with the apartment. And this is because the, every apartment has to have two, uh, two hours of sun every day. So you can have shorter ones uh, with the one room facing the sunny side and longer ones when these are, when these are facing east-west. And inside, uh, there are these apartments we were talking about. And the apartments, are, uh, they have uh, all, like they have kitchen, and then you have equally sized <coughs> apartments, because each apartment could be used to, uh, for one generation of the family to live in. It's not about like living room and sleeping rooms. They're all equal uh, sized. And I, my American friend uh, staying in uh, Russia in the 90s was telling that uh, he stopped going home with the women he was dating like different women and he stopped going home to their places because there would be always other people living in the house. He would come in and it would be, oh, grandmother in that room. Oh, sometimes a husband, sometimes. So it's uh, like this are cells for several families to uh, uh, spend time. And this are like, uh, this typology is that there is one, there were a number of successful series, the one uh, which is called P44, that's the most successful. The whole Soviet Union was covered with just this one. There's a second less successful, and once we, were got, we got our first kind of job to do a prefabricated building, and the factory uh, asked us to look at uh, the series if anything could be done, like a little bit of color or something, just make it look decent. So we took the whole, like investigated how this uh, series P3M, uh, the life of P3M, this is the life of P3M from 1975 to 2017. And we even did a timeline how this Syria could, uh, was, de was developed. Every decade, decade that uh, the building got something new. So in the beginning it was pure modernistic block, and then in 10 years it got a crown, and in our 10 years it, it got a porch. And so at the end it, it uh, was converted uh, in uh, such yeah. <laughs> in the bottom you have the original panels like very straight modernistic and on uh, the top you have a postmodern building so that uh, how the modern buildings became the postmodern uh, but uh, there was a big housing need in the 60s and but still there is a, a, enormous uh, uh, pressure on the housing market and uh, we, in the very beginning of our office, we, too, we were making this installation uh, when we put all the uh, housing that Moscow was supposed to build, it's 20 million square meters by 2020, as the sections on the wall and made a movie because we think that uh, uh, prefab is actually our vernacular. You have uh, concrete in Portugal, you have masonry in Holland, 
prefabricated factories, that's our vernacular. So it's, it's there, there are 10 factories around Moscow, and you, I mean, you have to use it because you cannot just leave the industrial heritage uh, uh, just there. So we thought of Mario coming to Moscow, jumping around and making all these wonderful buildings in prefabricated concrete. So actually how this uh, prefab construction works, usually it's a long, long uh, path, uh, it could be even mile long, uh, that's how it uh, used to work. So this were like, like 10 factories uh, with this enormous production line, and then you have a mold, or you, you used to have a mold went to the factory, uh, where you put the tiles upside down in a metal mold, and the tiles are not, don't have very straight edges, so they all laid the crooked. Then they pour concrete over it, then they put uh, prefabricated, they put uh, metal um, uh, reinforcement, more concrete, more uh, and insulation, more, so we have three layers of panel, and then they, the edges are hinged, you open the hinge and you take it out. And the uh, first thing, the sizes, they were not uh, equal to the size of the length of the panel, so you always have the tiles cut up in smaller pieces. Second, it's uh, like the mold, you can only make one size in it. And a mold costs a million. We ask them how much is the mold? A million. Every mold would cost a million. So if you need to have to, to, to change something, you have to make a new a million whatever rubles mold. And then you have, have a corner element. You have one person sitting in the corner and gluing elements with a glue gun. See the glue gun? <laughs> These are tiles and <laughs> 45 degrees. First you cut them 45 degrees. And we're talking about like million of square meters of 25 stories tall buildings. But that was in the past. We looked at it and we said, guys, there is no way we can update your series. You just have to like, buy new equipment, which... Uh, and so some, um, uh, some developers just bought these uh, factories and they upgrade them. So they got a, a new magnet mold and it's, now it's get, got a flexible technology and it gives the big uh, opportunity to the architects and to the builders actually. And, uh, uh, and uh, this is, uh, we were commissioned to the new housing, and this is how we actually we changed the panel. And what we did three simple steps. First, we just uh, put a a tiles which exactly fit to the panel. We make the joint straight, <coughs> and we offered to make uh, panels between joint as big as the panel between tiles. So we hide this. Uh, joints at all. So, so you can see it here. And uh, this jumping balance, it's not just about architecture, it's about to not allow people to glaze their balconies because they are very creative with glazing of balconies. Yeah, I have no respect for facades. <laughs> but we thought that we would do this trick, we do the hole, so it would take people some like extra energy to make a roof under the new. Well, okay, they succeeded, we failed, and now it's all glazed up, so we don't do these tricks anymore. <laughs> Doesn't work. Uh, how can you go about, you, you make a building that will be multiplied many times, and there are two ways to approach it. You can have, we tried first this kind of the old Soviet path. You can have a structure, rigid, it can be based on the parking uh, grid. You can have a set of uh, uh, ducts, or a set of uh, shafts, and then you would think that you could uh, put any program on this uh, uh, system. So it's not. I think it's not very well seen. But you have this uh, system of long walls, short walls. And in between, you have uh, different ways of putting the apartments. Uh, but that didn't really work with the market. And we offer the system, which is actually has a, it's a system, but it's super flexible. It could be grown in a uh, in a length, and it could be grown in in a width. But with the step of 30 centimeters. Yeah, and the step of 30 centimeters is based first on the tile size and second on IKEA furniture. So it's a tool that gives the developer, who is developing a lot of housing, a possibility to uh, basically, you, have, you, you develop a planning grid, not a structural grid. And with that grid, they can make many projects at the same time very quick. So we're working against ourselves. Uh, it's a system where one, one unit grows, the apartment grows, the city block grows, and they can put the, sort of every program of housing on every new spot they get to develop. 
this is kind of this uh, growing very, it, it looks easy, but it took us two years to develop, to, to make it straight, because the houses are so small that you have to look at every door, every corner, and they sort of really master this system that would uh, the, allow for, uh, have apartments like extra small, a little bit larger, because they're all still different buyers. People are buying, they have exactly like more money to uh, buy extra square meter. It's, it makes a big difference. So you have to make an offer of all of them to be able to buy an apartment like a little smaller, a little bigger that they fancy. And uh, it's, uh, you get not a client, you get uh, a set of IKEA furniture that you work your apartment around. And what I said, extra 60 centimeters allow a person to put a crib and it's already a young family in this apartment. Or, so you will work uh, with this uh, nameless sets of IKEA furniture, put program around it and make this rigid system that's uh, on the inside of housing. And sometimes apartment are so sm apartments are so small, then you move one furniture piece, you have to move the facade. And we actually invent the system which is quite rigid inside, but it has uh, outside layers, which could be totally different, but they uh, consist of, uh, out of several elements, which are, are air conditioning boxes, this is balconies, and this is the, uh, every time different materials. So you could play with this in extremely different variations. And you need that because that's uh, the site uh, you, you get to work, you get to build a million square meters with an office of 20 people uh, when you do and the master plan and every house. Of course, it works quicker with the, when you have such a system, but that's what we were like, doing and it takes a lot of exercise. So he, with this developer, we realized 10 projects in Moscow and we can do it like this, or we can do it like that, we can do it like this with these windows that are supposed to be round, but uh, no one took a risk to make a round window, so they look round, but they're square inside. <laughs> uh, no, uh, you can do it like this, uh, you can do it like that, you can do it this way, that way, and you might think, why so much color? Well, two-thirds of the year, it's gray, and God, we need color. <laughs> um, and then something happened that the client we were working for merged with another factory, and they just got 365 new sites. And we look at the web page a couple of months later, and we see that everything that we left on their desktop, all the options that we were working for for the past well, 10, what was it, four or five, no, no, okay, three, four years, they're all built. And then, but it, yeah, you know it's open source, you work, you know that you work with systems, you create a system, but not all of these options were great. And then they have 700 architects working for them who keep using because every time we do a project, we look at the surroundings. If it's a white area, we do it colorful. If it's a colorful or mixed area, we do it different. Um, then you realize you created a monster. Well, the only thing that we can say in our defense, it's a quite a happy monster. And uh, let's go back to micro district and look how uh, at, it, at it organization. So the typical micro district has a different uh, buildings from. 60s, 70s, and 80s, and you see here this pale, pale gray. It's um, this Khrushchevkas, and uh, the brown. It's uh, buildings, long buildings from 70s, and this uh, orange one. It's like postmodernistic 90s already. And in the middle of uh, every every micro you have you know, social buildings like schools and kindergartens. And uh, it has the very complicated system of inner paths, and actually no, no one of them uh, just going straight from the whole plot. It's, it's impossible. Uh, so as Julie said, the kindergartens and uh, um, schools are safely uh, put inside the district because you were supposed to live there and to bring your child uh, 
in the same area. Of course, that doesn't work anymore because you have to find a better school for your child. But you cannot get to the school. If you have to bring your child in the morning by car, you cannot get. You have to park elsewhere and then walk through the Maitre district in winter to bring your uh, kid to school or kindergarten. And another thing that happened is that in the Soviet city, land belonged to everyone. City belonged to everyone, but it couldn't go on like that. So they are doing property lines. And the most clear property lines are for schools and kindergartens, but all the... Other houses are also getting, like you get together with the owners and you demarcate the property line and you put it in the cadaster, which means, and, and, and that is happening completely unorganized. So now what's happening is that the buildings from the 60s are going to be, they are going to take 800 of uh, this uh, Khrushchev, because the last ones they're going to take down, there is uh, empty, the, the, this empty areas, but the property lines got, got already so complicated that there is no way that you can bring this district and micro district is four, size, four times uh, the size of, uh, let's say, average uh, city block. You, there's no way that you can, in most cases, you can bring it, uh, you can break it down to smaller parts because you cannot trace anymore the roads to kind of bring down the scale because there are property lines in the middle. And was, uh, now there was a big competition what to do with these uh, areas because they want to densify them almost twice to put, to, when the Khrushchevkas are going, to put uh, twice as much housing, like a 2.3 far on that uh, area to, uh, that the city won't grow, grow inside, that doesn't grow outside. So it's still not clear how to deal with it. But uh, the good thing about property lines of school and kindergartens is that you have green heart inside of each Micro rayon, the, and it belongs to the Ministry of Education. So the green plots are in the middle, and that's something that is kept, and it is something that gives a certain quality. And uh, uh, having this in mind, we actually we, we were commissioned to do the kindergarten, and before that we, we do <laughs> the <laughs> research, and actually the, we see that it's one one thousand seven hundred twenty seven schools in Moscow, and all of the, them look typically. So we have basically four different typologies from 50s, from 70s, from 90s, and from 2000. And you see how <coughs> then the, the younger school is, then the bigger plot it has. Yeah, so no, people not only lived in the same apartments, they also went to the same school. Julie went to, I went to the, this first one, the smallest one, Julie went to the second one. The airplane shape. Yeah. The yeah, she went to the airplane, I went to the, uh, the 50s one. And uh, all these territories are fenced off, and it looks like this. This are uh, probably two schools in the middle with a sports area inside, boarding. And with, uh, like five years ago we had a workshop with Archipri students, and uh, our challenge was to rethink what uh, we can to do with this areas in the middle of the micro districts and we made a series of uh, <laughs> proposals, proposals yeah. <laughs> like, what if we want to change the current situation what if we open up the fence just the simple one yeah, yeah. and the fence sorry this uh, the fence is gated area so when my son goes to school you like, it's completely closed pyramid it's closed in the first uh, when you enter the, the, kind of the, 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 the area and then it's also uh, you, you have a card when you enter the school building so when my son goes to school, I get this SMS, Max entered the object. And then when he goes home, say, Max left the object. Very military. <laughs> so we continue with these uh, proposals. And uh, what happened if we uh, reshape the fence to allow uh, for different uses? And uh, if we just swap the uses of the school and the blocks? and we could do the sport on top of the school roof, or what uh, might happen if the schoolyard became a campsite, a campsite, or we just uh, invert the school and the schoolyard, or we put the school on top of the surrounding block. Yeah, because uh, children are complaining that they feel looked at <laughs> all the time, <laughs> that the parents are watching. And... Uh, what if we made the school as an island, or we add the holy cows, 
or we stuck uh, all of the typologies into the school tower just Me to mega create school. a mega school and a mega city, or we, the invaders take over the schoolyards. Or, and so having this in mind, we got this commission to do kindergarten. And uh, unlike in the areas that we showed before, nowadays uh, the kindergartens get gets this kind of residual spots whatever is left from housing, when the housing is sold, the developer has to build a uh, kindergarten and a school and give it to the state. Uh, so you get this plot where we tried different things and then we thought the only thing that could save it is a round shape. But uh, as we mentioned before, as uh, every master plan, uh, every public building is done with Excel sheet as well. So everybody wants to have a, a different architecture nowadays, but the program is still the same. Every kid uh, get every, the exact amount of square meters per... For ever, for whatever forever. activity they whatever take. Activity. So, so try yeah. to put this Excel program into the round shape. And we managed to do that. Yeah, that took the most time. Because also, because you give it to the city, there is no... Uh, you, you cannot exceed the program by a square meter. You, there is no one to negotiate to because you just, you have the, you go to Excel, you deliver it. And you don't talk about the director of the kindergarten, oh, how, shall we make like a common area or shall we make, there's like, no, it's absolutely not malleable. Just like whatever is in the brief, whatever is in the min Ministry of Education brief, you should like bring to stay to the, to the project, no discussion. So and it's way stupid because you waste a lot of time just fitting in spaces in the program instead of doing more beautiful things and creating spaces for kids. But still, yeah, that's the, the reality. So we managed to do, you see, like a lot of small rooms because you have to go from one bathroom to get into another bathroom. It's very, it's uh, done, whoever did this Excel didn't really think a lot about children, just thought about like mechanical processes. And it's uh, built, and the fun, another funny thing is that when uh, the contractor who was supposed to do the windows won the tender, they only gave him plans, not the elevations. <laughs> and then when we finally gave him the elevations, he was pretty upset. But he already signed the contract, uh, yeah, it was not, not easy. <laughs> and to entertain uh, ourselves and our actually developer during this boring process of fitting the square meters into the round shape, they made an interior project uh, as, a, as a book, uh, how children could spend their day in this kindergarten. So at, at uh, eight they're coming home, at 11 they have uh, breakfast, they have lessons, and they have uh, some leisure stuff. So we, uh, we, we, we draw all these things and they built, and they built it. Yeah, that's how it looked in the end. And we have to say that uh, uh, they're quite happy and then the kindergartens get advertised in this uh, articles how ideal kindergartens should be. So we see it all the time uh, popping up in a psychological journal and this kind of... Uh, so that's uh, quite uh, a success. And then um, uh, we also do public space that uh, didn't exist before. Uh, and... Uh, there was a first uh, competition for what uh, Amal mentions, Triumphalne Square in the center of Moscow. So we decided to take part. And uh, this is a, one of the famous places in Moscow, which uh, and the, the square sits on the crossing of Main, square to, Main Street to the sky and the Garden Ring. And there is a Maikovsky monument in the middle, and there is a big concert hall on the left side, and there is the architectural city authorities on the right side. So everybody knows this place, and uh, everybody remembers this place as a romantic uh, place in, from the 60s when a poet gathered together around this monument and, de and claim, declaimed the uh, poems. So it was very uh, famous and uh, Romantic. Yeah, to, 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 that's a place to uh, have a rendezvous, to have a temple. And it's also known for the, the protests on the 31st, because every second uh, month, on the 31st of each month, 
people would uh, gather there to uh, uh, defend the freedom of uh, gathering, and it's the 31st article of the Constitution. So they would come there every 31st of the month, stand there, and then get, get picked up by the police every two months, the same thing again. And the city would always find something to close the square. They would uh, close it for architectural, for uh, archaeological research, or put a big uh, restaurant, like a big restaurant, like something, no, not really openly close it, but sort of uh, make it very difficult to use. And uh, this square is on top of the famous and beautiful, most beautiful uh, rail, metro railway, railway station, uh, Maykovsky. And here you can see how in the end of 50s, uh, they tried to find the best place for the Monikovsky monument. It was before then Photoshop came to our practice. And it was a one-to-one -one model, and they tried to find the uh, this best place not to uh, cover uh, the view to the Stalinistic Vysotka at the perspective. So, uh, legally, uh, if you work with a state project, you have to go through a tender process. So there cannot be any competitions uh, because you have to have a bank guarantee. It's just there is a law that doesn't allow for competitions. Uh, you just submit your uh, whatever package and then you win the tender. It's not the best project that wins, but the cheapest proposal, which is strange when it's about public projects. And um, previous to that, they uh, started with Gorky Park. And it was a big thing when uh, the city turned a place that was really shabby, scary, uh, and the place that you would rather avoid uh, in a one year, they turned it into this urban planner f feast, basically. The first thing they did, they opened public bathrooms and they put guards on bicycles in the forest that they kind of merged with the environment, but made it safe. And uh, it became incredibly popular, and it sort of uh, created uh, and brought back city culture, or this kind of culture of outside living, because... The kind of, in Soviet times, there were no restaurants. People would not go out on the street or kind of... The, the whole life happened in the kitchen. There was no, like, public street life at all. Of course, slowly the city is changing. There are more open, re restaurant opening. And uh, this Gorky Park became a place where everyone went and it's just enjoyed being together in a public space. It was something completely new. And they also say that this is also was the kind of the beginning of this protest movement in the, the, what, the 2000, the white, the, the white Ribbon movement, when people, people felt together, and that's because of the public space. So suddenly in the newspaper there was a small article that a company who usually builds uh, bridges and uh, hospitals won a tender for this Triumphalne Square. And this was not, the first, the first time it, that, that it was not taken well. So people went out on the same square protesting there should be a public open competition. Uh, these are already architects and the one, people who like architecture. They're protesting and asking for public competition. And this uh, our young uh, city architect uh, also insisted and it was indeed the first public competition. And we luckily won this competition with the idea of the empty square because we were impressed with this view and we think that this, the, the thought that it's a good uh, to have this empty space just to relax and to stay in a calm. And we propose uh, our design in six steps. First, we <coughs> decided to make two very clear uh, square, one is a big one, open, and the second one in, in the back, you see it in the number one, it's a, a more intimate space, fenced off. And number two, it's uh, to make this square flat, because it has a relief. And uh, number three, it's make it classical, to keep this classical city composition, and to put the career out of the uh, trees, to make the human scale, 
fourth step was to make it romantic and to put these wings, as we said before. And uh, number five, it's to make it more romantic at, at the lilac, lilac in the back courtyard, back, back square. And number six is to make it possible. And we propose to do the pop-up swings to, for... Chairs. <laughs> pop-up chairs to, to make an open concert on, on the square. So, the, yeah, this idea of uh, swing as a center of uh, court's uh, yard, this whole yard life happening in the old blocks. Uh, these were competition uh, images with this row of trees that would kind of bring down the scale. This is the closed uh, the secret uh, lilac garden in the back, uh, and the view to the Beijing Hotel in the back. So then the competition passed away, but we had to realize this project. And we went to city authorities, and they said, empty square? No, never. Nobody wanted to have an empty square in, in this place. And they, they were asked to put just some seats, some pavilions, some flower just beds. Just make it a little. You know, just like to occupy this square before some people will come. And of course, our first reaction was no, never. It's our competition. It was empty square. And they said, okay, somebody else will do it. So we got up and said, yeah, we're not going to do this. Walk to the door and said, okay, any, anyone else could do it. And then we <laughs> somehow... Well, thinking again, <laughs> and uh, design, let's, talk, let's talk about design it. Design our project for the second time, redesign it. Uh, it was also the first time that the voting platform, that kind of uh, the public hearing platform, was tested. Um, it was advertised everywhere, and we were asked to prepare options so people could vote if they like the square, they don't like the square. Of course, the, the questions were not formed this way, because the questions were like, "Do you want to have square with trees?" or oh, without trees, duh. <laughs> so like, but still, uh, it, uh, I don't remember, but thousands of people, it, the reaction was incredible because family and friends were calling us and asking, what should we vote? I said, That's public vote, like vote whatever you want. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, also options for pavilions, they were not serious questions in the end. Of course it was, kind of manipulated. But nevertheless, it, uh, people got engaged and uh, they felt like they um, have a say. And like this, it doesn't happen with architecture. Of course, public space seems to be much more, people are much more sensitive about uh, public space than they are about whatever house we built there, feels like. Um, and uh, the first, actually, the first reaction was super negative. When they opened the square, and we have uh, a day of Moscow, it's the fourth of, first Saturday of September, all the projects have to be finished. Like, whatever you're building, the first the day of the city, all the projects have to be finished. So it was opened, and then there was, oh, the swings are stupid, you cannot see Mayakovsky legs, like too many people, like super negative uh, feedback. The next morning, a famous blogger is writing, the square is great. And we get, wow, the square is great. And then we get public vote. And 95% of the population said it's beautiful squares. Yeah. So, um, and it actually, it works uh, quite like, surprisingly well. And the swing is an element that people are queuing uh, the, the swings are for two people, so it's a place where you should uh, fix your date. But the problem is that they're so popular that you have to come or long in advance or queue to uh, use the yeah, before your date. To, so, yeah, um, and everybody who comes out of the metro station like somehow stops and or people wait there. It's really a thing that is. Uh, it, like we didn't expect it to be so uh, to, to, to work uh, so well for all the edges. That also dogs. We have one picture with dogs, and uh, it smells. Uh, the flowers uh, smell in summer. But another funny episode that when we uh, uh, won the competition, a company who uh, uh, initially won the tender was still building it, and we were nobody in this process because legally we were no one. And all we had to do to go every side to every time to the building site and make them uh, like just check what they were doing, 
and the control that they are not doing something wrong, and then they made, made them listen to us even we were nobody. It was a very exciting process. And when we were in, in autumn, we were going to the city architect, and then we saw our landscape girl. She was like sticking out of the flower bed, and it's uh, October, it's this brown earth, it's raining, it's cold. Apparently, people from uh, Moscow Green Company came and planted uh, trees just in, uh, just in, in a grid. And she was passing by also to the city architect. She saw it and she got herself into the mud and she took all the bulbs and put them like she thought that it should be, much better than like it is on this picture. So, uh, and it still has this uh, Soviet flair to it. And people get still picked up. There's still a lot of space for the protest. And um, in general, we, we saw how it changed from the place of transit where people would run through without stopping into some place of stay, where people stay together, they look each other into the eyes, they kind of communicate around the swings. And even ourselves, when we go to the city architect, we like, stop there in, in, in summer and sit and watch. And it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a kind of working, uh, nice... Uh, environment that made the whole, these places they make the city, and Moscow is used to be a very rigid city. They make a city much softer, human, and kind of a really better place to be. So we think that we have a very powerful uh, profession, and we, since uh, we're working in this kind of uh, um, transit uh, period, then we saw that what we do changes people's uh, how they feel, how li they live in the houses. Uh, for example, they don't in these public areas. Nobody breaks windows, or they are careful about their court, about their kind of uh, courtyards. They are careful about the elevators and about because the whole uh, surrounding changes the way they behave and the way they feel. And it's very was in this coming in this past to the ten years was very exciting for us to see. So you have all the power, and we wish you use it to the best of this world. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank, thank you very much for that great lecture. Funny, inspiring. We're going to go straight um, to some questions. I was just wondering, I, I don't think it's a question about the work directly, but something that you mentioned that was very interesting, which was the process of going from an unmarked and bordered um, city because of the of the regime, um, to then you know lines being kind of drawn, which is you know a result of how we here operate, right? Like the the, the democratic capitalist society, whatever. Um, how how did that happen? And have you also thought about this and and dealt with that in your practice because it's it's fascinating the way that we know you know like today you're putting these border lines where we put our borders in colonialism right mm -hmm. <laughs> well the, the thing is that the thing is that it didn't really happen whatever happened it happened accidentally oh okay but, so, but you have the registry of property yeah now. you have the cadaster you have the registry and uh, slowly it's filled up with the uh, like each house uh, gets uh, property line, but there is no <laughs> space left for uh, public green or for like inside. It's all border to border, and they're all crooked. So it's really it it will be a big problem in the future. And uh, when we were doing this uh, competition about uh, the Moscow renovation, everyone saw that it's a, a big problem because it doesn't allow for densification, for f further development. It's completely uncontrolled. And uh, we're also not sure what uh, to do with it, but it will have uh, very <laughs> far-going consequences. You know, it was a, it was a very um, inspiring lecture about a way to kind of carve a path and work with constraints, work with systems, use your um, creativity in different ways, have a human um, touch. And I'm wondering kind of about the scalability of that approach. In other words, what's the culture like in architecture schools 
um, you know, where you teach and where you're uh, involved and where probably students are being inspired by your kind of work. And is there a, a chance for them to develop a practice like yours? I'm sure you're a model for them. Um, but but is, that a, is, it, is it a path that's replicable? And I was thinking on the flip side, who, who works in these offices that, you know, imitate your floor plans or in the government offices that review all of these submittals? Is it the same students from those architecture schools who had wanted to <laughs> create the practice you have but then have to go into those jobs? No, no, we think that our niche is quite unique and we were just lucky to, not lucky, okay, lucky in the sense that it was an, a great adventure. But, uh, yeah, we don't think that planning should happen this way because we're using, we're completely conscious of the fact that we're using uh, social housing tools for commercial development. I mean, it's a, in a way immoral. I mean, yeah, there is no way around it. But, okay, the, you can say that we, this allows commercial development to be affordable. So it's quickly built, the margin is uh, lower, and the prices are, uh, yeah, and to make housing production of a higher quality that lasts longer, that's what we can say in our defense. But in general, yeah. It's a very difficult question because uh, you have we like coming from Holland where or from anywhere else where you have uh, architects with their architecture like you do something you own it it's your copyright everything like it should be it on the other hand it gives uh, a collection of individual architecture that looks in the end equally uh, monotonous in its diversity. So, of course, intellectually for us, it's interesting to work with systems because it, like, you do something, it's getting replicated by 100, and you see, like, it's a mathematical exercise. But, yeah, the ethical consequences of it are debatable, definitely. Uh, but just one follow-up. But, uh, for example, with the kindergarten or the uh, public square, those seem like maybe um, model-breaking projects. They might break the, the previous model and allow for new possibilities. Have you seen, um, you know, more um, opportunities for creativity in those, in those contexts because of your demonstration that these can be successful by kind of breaking the mold? Uh, yeah, we hope so. At least the uh everything, with, also we tell our students that everything is possible, you just have to try harder and harder and harder and have more. But it also makes it, makes it more ex exciting. The more limitations you have, the more interesting it is to formulate a new task or a new, how you go around. But then the thing is that you're concentrating on going around difficulties instead of concentrating on beautiful design. That's what we were complaining about with kindergarten. It appears to me that there are a lot of things standing in the way for you to sort of exert your creativity and you almost you have to work in, in very great confines. So do you see any, um, any things that you would like to see changed in, I don't know, either the government or other, maybe any, any social changes that you would like to see that would somehow facilitate... Um, a change so that you don't have to work within these confines? Where shall we start? How much time do you have? <laughs> Brief. <laughs> what, uh, okay, to, um, let's say that the norms have to be all changed, but uh, we have uh, uh, Strelk Institute, and it's a kind of special organization that uh, started as an education, as a school, and uh, Rem Kolhas was dean of it for a couple of, uh, for like three years, was in charge of educational program. And then it grew out to a very powerful institution consisting of three parts. They have Strelka Architects, you have Strelka KB, and it's a research uh, institute. And they have 300 people under 30 that are working on changing norms, and we're consulting and work with them together. Uh, they made a list of all the, because it's a, it's a Soviet heritage and people don't realize that it's completely unnecessary, like with urban code that I was talking about, or 
uh, it all has to be changed. But then the big question is what can be uh, kept, like these green areas that we were talking about. Because there are some things that are sort of socially very helpful and interesting and don't allow for the kind of out of control commercial development and other things can be really dropped. So it's big, there's big work going on and it's very cool because it's done by really young people and they're very like, young, shameless, really energetic. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's something that's going on there and it's a very positive development. You were talking about what, 30 square meters? Um, 40 27 square is the smallest. This XS is 27 studio, 27 square meter studio. Okay, for New York it's not so small, I guess. And, and how much do they cost? Uh, like compared to, you know, well, I guess you can't compare to New York. 5 million, <laughs> smallest one, I guess, per square meter. $2,000 a square meter. So, so they are subsidized still a lot, no? No. But the, mm, people get mortgage, and then the, even our the employees get mortgage. We don't, our employees do. <laughs> it's expensive, but uh, it's given easily to young people. Okay. And there is no rent, there is no, like, still the rent is not working out. The state is taking more control, again. Uh, and uh, they want to develop uh, this institution of rental housing, not necessarily social, but rental housing. And there you could actually have more space for experimentation and for new typologies, because it's, of course, extremely uniform what, what we do. It's the same apartments over and over and over again, and there is no, even, like, even the round window is not possible. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's interesting because um, what we see in the US, and I'm from Brazil, and you see it in Brazil too, you know, the, the cost of living and the amount of stuff that you can buy is decreasing, right? So there's a whole tendency of sharing things and, you know, have, having houses that, you know, Berlin is a great experiment in that and other cities. There's a lot of experiments um, also in Sao Paulo in Brazil. So it's interesting that you could maybe, you know, you and you're coming from the other end and coming, you know, so maybe these things come together and you have a great chance to experiment with um, yeah, um, co-living models also yeah. but the people still use it as an investment so every like, in Moscow everything is still sold it's, uh, the market is just insaturable so the, 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 the alternative models are not really um, required yet but they, definitely that it will come as well maybe a more optimistic question is there anything that you think this model has is right or something about the typology that you think should extend and influence architects and designers outside of of Russia? Well big living kitchen is nice. <laughs> <laughs> the like when I went to Holland this, this small linear kitchen was not so nice because you couldn't say that everything is happening in the kitchen. All the people drink, people eat, people spend time. It's a mixture, like living room and kitchen. Um, what else? I have to think about it. Yeah, actually glazed balcony is also kind of cool because they let the people express themselves on our facades. Does the participation of international architects in Moscow, does it help break the constraints of the spreadsheet or does it help open up new territory for you or is it more of a hindrance? It can be only broken from the inside. But you have a point here because when they built Zaredia Park, Julian Scofidio uh, built this mega attraction, then now of course it's an argument you cannot do it. Like they did it in Zaredia, so you can do it. So, of course, the examples set that uh, show that, oh, now Hetzka and Domorong will build a uh, building, enormous housing on Pilotis, that was also changed. Yeah, in, in a way, it doesn't help to bring the code, but it does help to set uh, an example. A garage was also a, a big eye-opener. So every project uh, that is brought with international experience does break 
this kind of the impossible. That's the th that the sentence that we hear like all the time for 15 years. You cannot do this. You cannot do this. You cannot do this. And it's like, yes, you can. Just keep uh, proving. Keep like, keep insisting. Yes, you can. And uh, of course, this international projects help a lot to prove that you can. I have a question about the participation of the public or of the people eventually living in, in your buildings. You mentioned with some of your early housing projects that you were um, moving away from allowing people to build out their balconies. Um, and so in that case, less participation in the actual design, um, kind of the half a house model. Um, but then you also expanded on participation in a feedback context with um, the public spaces. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about where you see the public or the resident engaging with design. Is it purely in expressing what they want or is it also in kind of giving more specific design feedback and being able to shape the design you ultimately provide? So what is happening uh, now a lot is the uh, bottom up from top down. People are forced to participate. Like participate, participatory pl plan is now, that's the, uh, the city said everyone has to participate. So now they brought to, you, you have a project and then uh, you call people together. It's, it's, it became obligatory, which is exactly, I think, could happen another way around. And we also we went to public hearings and everybody's super afraid of this public hearings. Of course, the uh, platform is uh, much easier with that because you just press the button, you don't see the faces. So, but I have to say public hearings were super nice uh, because you talk to different groups and, and they really tell you what they want and it's much easier to because you cannot uh, you cannot invent what they want it was about public it was about another park and there were a group of uh, ping pong players they want new tables and there were other people and then no one likes people with dogs and they, but people with dogs also want something so they kept fighting between themselves and we were like negotiating their interests at the table and it was very actually uh, very helpful. Oh, yeah, and that is usually happening uh, when the project is done, not during the project. So uh, to answer your question is that uh, uh, it's probably better to give people a choice and to show them something, and then they can agree, correct, or participate in that way. I think participation on, like, from the very beginning is not really working. It's better to offer them choices than to uh, ask them to invent things. Because it's our job to invent things. Um, first of all, uh, I really appreciate your presentation. I learned a lot and it was very interesting. I have a question about your tilted facade in this uh, building. Why you tilted? Is it? It was because of the view, or 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 it was because of the lighting, or it was just the beauty purpose. This is my first question, and the second one is, how's the um, the number of the apartment per parking? Do you have to provide parking spaces, or is there any restriction about that? Well, we turned it because we have ten more buildings to do in this area, next to each other. So you have to do something. Unfortunately, it's not about the view in this case. I mean, air cares are nice in the apartments, but of course it's about the view, yeah, right. Um, uh, oh, yeah, about the sun too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the parking is um, 1.9 uh, car per apartment, depending on how far you are from the subway. It's a big numbers and we're trying, yeah, it became, it used to be very strict, now it's more flexible, so when you're going to close the subway station, then you, it's, it's less, it's uh, one. And uh, yeah, we try to integrate it always in the street profile. So it's with a new, it, it, it works really bad in these micro districts because you don't have enough street surface to integrate it in street profile. In a block city, it works much better because you have enough, usually enough length to integrate it. But no one, uh, since parking got uh, expensive, no one drives the car, everyone is using shared uh, uh, kind of cash, cash sharing. So I have, a, um, I think your description of the prefab 
was uh, really interesting, of course, as architects seeing the factory and the changes that you made in a, in a different context or different cultural context or country. Do you like the prefab or do you not like it? I was trying to, I, you're working within a system and clearly you understand the system and advantage of it. Do you, like, uh, uh, is that something that if someone else was building in a different city where you didn't have the other constraints? Well, prefab in itself is just technology. It, it has one big advantage that it's all weather, so it allows you to build. In, in cold countries, it's very, and it doesn't, <laughs> it can be beautiful, it can be ugly, it depends on which, uh, as a technology, it's smart. But you need the uh, industrial background to it, so it cannot work everywhere. Uh, we're indifferent to it in a way, uh, because if it works in some places, it, it, it works in others. It doesn't, depends on what vernacular you have in the place. Well, once again, please join me in thanking Olga and Julia. What a great way to begin our semester.